Well, that was an unbelievable song. It leads up to what we're going to talk about tonight. The first thing I want to say is congratulations to uh, Jackie Robinson. And today was his first day in the big leagues. And I think all the teams are wearing number 42. Unfortunately, uh, the Yankees are not wearing 42 tonight. Uh, maybe uh, because they're playing tomorrow night at the stadium, maybe they'll uh, wear Jackie's uh, uh, jersey tomorrow night. But first thing, Dan, I want to introduce you as my future Hall of Fame writer, okay? And I really do mean this, okay? And people, fans, we've been working on this book for almost, what, two years now, right? Yeah, and, two, I think we started in February of 2019. And this is actually just the second time I've actually ever met him. <laughs> we have many, many conversations. Is it right, Dan? Yeah, we, we, we were talking on the phone. For, uh, well, we still talk on the phone uh, several times a week. But when we were working on the book, we would, you know, uh, we would talk for at least a couple hours every uh, uh, every couple of days, uh, you know, just just kind of getting it, getting it together. And, you know, it was uh, hearing your uh, all your stories and bringing up topics to ask you about. And uh, we had a lot of fun. And I think we got a really good book out of it. We did. You know, I had no, okay, first thing, I just want to let you know, when I did that designated Hebrew, people don't realize what it takes to write a book. Okay. The designated Hebrew, when that came out 2006 or 2007, whatever, that's a long time ago, but it just came out again in 2020 for on the paperback. And it did extremely well. And, and, you know, I appreciate the people and uh, uh, to read that book also. But it took a lot of, you know, it, it really, Dan, I mean, it really took a lot of uh, 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 talking back and forth to Dan Schlausberg, who uh, was the uh, a co-author of that book also. Right. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it anymore. This is, this is all, at least uh, now I can say to people, I became an author. Right. And I, I was so excited because people never realized I barely got out of English class in my high school. <laughs> I don't even know if I really got my degree, to be honest with you. And when I when I passed my English course, I think I did because I never saw my last report card. I don't know if they wanted to show it to me or not, but uh, uh, she would be rolling over in, in her grave to see that what has happened transpired from 19, 2006 to 2021. And this book, when it finished in 2021, let me first thing real, real quickly, because we wanna talk about the notes and, uh, nuts and the bolts of this uh, uh, book a little bit. But basically people ask me, how did I really get this thing started? It was in fantasy camp. Really? And it was in fantasy camp yeah, about six or seven years ago. And uh, when Marty Appel and there was a couple of other writers did Thurman's book, they wrote, I read it and Marty sent me a free copy. It was great. And it was a great book, super yeah, book. It's a really good book. But it never showed what type of person he actually was. It showed how great a ball player he was, okay? And it showed how mean he was to the writers. Right. And, you know, and, you know, I'm reading all this and, you know, and he has another hat to him. And when Marty Appel and there was other couple of writers went up to Diana and asked her to do the forward of the book. This is before I even knew that I was even thinking about doing a book. OK. Right. She, we were talking, she was down at Yankee Fantasy Camp and we were talking about Thermy, and then we talked about her and uh, uh, having a great time, you know, in uh, uh, Canton. And, you know, she was doing a lot of different things and she was working around the house and with her kids. And, you know, so it was, it was nice. It was really great. And I said, Diana, and I thought at that second, and I really never even said to myself, I was going to write a book. I said, if I 
if I asked you to do something, would you do it? She said, what? I said, I'm thinking about writing a book about Thurman. And I like for you to do the forward of the book. And you know, and she turned out all, already the uh, uh, other writers. And I, that's all I needed. She was going to turn me down, and my ego was just going to be—it it was going to die. It, no, no, no. I was thinking about this. Yeah. That's why I never asked for autographs of ball players because I could see where an, I asked for some uh, an autograph from somebody, and they say, "No, I don't give it down." I never yeah. asked anybody for an autograph. Nobody. But when this book become very, very successful like it is, I'm going to ask you for your autograph. Okay. Now that's the only autograph. Okay. So I asked, I said, Diana, would you be, would you write the forward of the book? And she looked at me, she said, yes. And I said, oh, really? And I'm thinking to myself, I said, I haven't even thought about writing the book yet. Right. And I, I didn't even know, I didn't even have, I didn't tell my literary agent that I was thinking about writing a book. And I said, oh, no, I got to start all this all over again. And so we're so close. And she said, I would do it for you. I'm not going to do it for you. I wouldn't do it for anybody else. She said, I know how close you are. And I know that if you say something about, you know, Thurman, it's going to be the truth. And yeah. I know that you're going to put him in on another way that people will realize what type of person that he really was. Okay. So... As soon as I got home from Yankee Fantasy Camp, I spoke to Rob Wilson, who was our literary agent. Right. And I said, Rob, I want to write another book. And I started thinking about myself. I want to write a book about designated Hebrew again, how I screwed up the game. It was going to be the title. Already right. made it up. How I screwed up the game of baseball. Okay. Right, but by being a designated hitter. Yeah. Yeah. How I screwed up the game, you know. And, you know, he said, it's not going to be big enough. Nobody would would like to uh, probably buy the book because, you know, I mean, everybody knows your story. Okay. So I said, okay. So I brought it out. I said, see if I wrote a book about Thurman. He, and he said, he said, Ron, you know, there's quite a few books that have been written about Thurman few, quite a few years ago. And Marty Appel just did a real, real big one. There was a very successful book. And I said, yes, but it talked all about baseball. But I want to talk about on and off the field, what we did on the field and what we did off the field. He said, that's a great idea. He said, I said, okay, who's going to write the book? You know, who's going to write it? I said, oh, no. I said, call, talk to Marty. And he said, Marty just wrote the book. He just wrote a book. He said he's not going to do it because he basically is retired. Right. And I, I started thinking. I said, okay, uh, uh, ask Bill Madden. He was on a project. He was on a project. And he, and I was talking about a few other people. I really didn't know too many. And Rob Wilson, he said, let me have a couple of days to think about it. And he contacted me. He said, I've got a great guy, a guy named Dan Epstein, who wrote some baseball books, who was very, very successful. And, but he was very big in the music industry. And he's done a lot of different things. And he, and, you know, he, he's a beautiful writer. He's a different type of writer. He's not a stat writer, but he talks about, you know, how it is to be a family and, you know, put that all together. So I said, okay. So he said, let me talk to Dan. So he contacted you, right? Right. And you, you did not really, you know, you really started thinking about, I don't want to do this again. Yeah. And, I read, <laughs> and I read, you know, because you had a book that didn't work out. Right. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I had a couple of projects, not baseball ones, but music ones where I or a similar sort of thing where I worked with somebody who is not a writer and they told me their story. And I, you know, uh, uh, put it into a proposal form for a book and, you know, both things that I was really excited about and both which, you know, one which just there was no interest in and one where the person I was working with went completely nuts and started demanding like a two hundred thousand dollar advance and uh you know and and was just, just and started like talking smack about our agent online and it was just like okay this is a bad scene i gotta go so yeah so when, when rob talked to me rob wilson talked to me about collaborating with you it was like well all right you know uh, this is not something i'm super interested in but you know you're ron bloomberg and you know you're 
certainly a figure in 70s baseball. I've written about you in the context of my book, Big Hair and Plastic Grass. Like, you know, uh, you know, I enjoyed designated Hebrew. I figured it would be fun to at least have a phone conversation with you and, you know, take it from there. And uh, you and I hit it off right away. And, and uh, I, I remember at the end of our, we, you and I talked for about an hour and a half. And at the end of it, you were like, so what do you think? We got a book? And I was like, yeah, I think we got a book, man. I think uh, I think we should do this. And, and here we are. Really, it was really, I mean, it was a great conversation because, you know, your major team at that particular time wasn't with the Yankees or with the Tigers. Right. It was Detroit Tigers. And you saw, and it's funny, and I said, I want to write a book, of course, about Thurman. He said, yeah, I, didn't you say that you saw him hit a home run at Tigers Stadium? That yeah. was your your first time you ever saw him play? Yeah, it was the first time I ever saw a Major League Baseball game. It was May 30th, 1976. Uh, my dad took me as kind of like a late birthday present. My birthday is in early May. And, but he, he got us tickets to see the Yankees because the Yankees were a big deal. And they were good again. And they were coming to town. And he's from New York. And uh, so we went. And, uh, yeah, Thurman was behind the plate that day. And Thurman hit a home run. And uh, I decided – you know, right there that even though I was a Tigers fan, Thurman was my favorite catcher. I mean, I just saw him kind of take control of the field. And, you know, I already knew he was a great player, but, but like to see, you know, when you're that age and you, you're so impressionable and you see somebody who, you know, is you, even if they're not good and they do well in that, in the first game you see, you're really impressed, but I knew he was one of the greats. And then to see him be great, it was it was huge for me. You know, when I played with Thurman and I knew that 99 percent of the writers hated to be around Thurman because he had they had no idea what he was going to do. He's going to give a one word answer. Right. Uh, he's going to look at him and say, you know, some bad words and walk to the training room. And, you know, then you hear yelling, you know, between Thurman and somebody. Uh, the writer's not going to yell, but he's yelling at the writer because the writer is afraid because that's our territory in there. And, you know, I mean, uh, you know, other than, you know, somebody like a Murray Allen, Murray Allen, uh, 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 Dick Young, uh, people like that, a uh, uh, Dick Shap, people in the uh, 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 media, okay? And uh, Thurman, if he didn't want to talk to him, he would just walk away. Right. He wouldn't ever yell at any of those guys because those are our beat writers. Those are the guys that follow us the whole year. Okay. Although, although he did get into it with Dick Young on a few occasions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But he didn't destroy him like he would like 98% of the writers. Right. You know, if you had a new writer from Connecticut, or New Jersey, or New York, one of maybe the smaller paper, or one of these beat writers, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, uh, that really would ask a crazy question. And, you know, Thurman, why did you strike out four times? You know, and then right off the bat, you can see his veins in his neck popping out. And this guy is trying to look like he's writing and he's trying to back away from Thurman and get behind all the writers. You know, I said, oh, no. And he's three, uh, uh, three lockers away from me. And, you know, I'm you know, I'm next to, uh, who was I next to? I think, uh, I forgot who I was next to. I think Pinella was in the locker next to me. So Pinella wanted to get out of there. He didn't want to laugh. So he goes in the training room. I'm sitting there just getting dressed and, you know, just listening because I love to listen to, you know, Thurman when he gets into it because it's like when he's on the baseball field and, you know, if he really gets mad at a player, this is what he will do. Right. And people would not see it because what uh, people don't realize if he really had to go after a player because being the captain, he, he didn't make cap being a captain till 76. Okay. Right. But, but before that he was the team captain, but didn't have the C on his uniform. Right. He was, he was really the team captain. He okay? had already assumed that responsibility. Assumed that responsibility. And if Thurman had to say something to somebody, he would take them into the, uh, 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 hallway and the, uh, and oh God, you can hear it. You know, you can hear the uh, the walls shaking and stuff. But then he comes out, everything is fine. The guy will come back, everything is fine. 
and you knew that this guy made a mistake and it made the team look bad and or made the pitcher look bad. So uh, Thurman made sure that never happened again. Okay, so I used to watch him and I said to myself, okay, people really do not realize what type of guy he really was. I, I did so many things. When I first came up, when I first came up in uh, 68 for, uh, for in September for the last 30 days, the 30 day call up, uh, Thurman was already up there also, okay? And uh, uh, we became very, very good friends. Uh, right. 1969. We lived at the, uh, 69. Uh, we lived at the Concourse Plaza uh, on the Grand Concourse. We used to walk to the ballpark back and forth and back and forth. Nobody had a car back then. Number one, nobody had enough money to buy a car. Nobody had enough money for taxi cabs going from the hotel. So, you know, for, you know, we stayed at the hotel. And the good part about it was, you know, I mean, of course he wasn't Jewish and being Jewish and I was going back and forth where all the delicatessen was. And I used to uh, go into a, delica a delicatessen called the Roxy right on 161st. And after every game, I would bring this guy, I forgot the guy, he's the owner of the, uh, the deli. We used to bring him a baseball or hat and then right. we always had our free pastrami and corned beef because we couldn't afford it. Back then, you know, the corned beef probably we had a platter for maybe $6. Now it's like a $45 platter. So right. $6 uh, in 1969. That's, that's, you know, that, that's, that's steep for, uh, for a couple of rookies. Oh, oh, you know, I mean, they still owe me meal money. <laughs> you know, every time I go, every time I go to the stadium, I always go to the accounting office and I always tell them, you know, th they're friends of mine in there. And they look at me, they said, no, your meal money, we haven't calculated your meal money yet. So I, <laughs> nah, I just wanted to say hello to you. Because I say hello, you know, there's not too many people when I was at the stadium are still there. And the accounting people, there's like two or three of them still in there. Uh, wow. There's a couple of people in the front office still there. And, you know, so I go up there and say hello to them. You know, that's what I do. Okay. But anyway, when you and I started going over uh, the stuff with Thurman, and you are the one that had to put everything together, and you hated me. I know that <laughs> Lindy's going to probably mute me because I'm talking too much, but I'm going to let you do all the talking in a minute. Okay. But I remember saying to you, okay, I'm going to talk. And you got to put it together because I, number one, I'm the most unorganized person. I'm just telling people, you know, I got, you know, I got uh, about uh, 10 Zooms and I got, I got a WCBS that I'm doing. I got bookings that I'm doing. I got this is I'm doing. I got ESPN, this I'm doing. I got so many things and I got it on a sheet and I'm so disorganized and I call up Lenny. And when he gives me the Zoom number to go on to, I lose it on my, uh, I lose it on my email. Okay. But that's, hey, I, everybody doesn't have everything. I don't have that. I don't have the ability for that. I said, Dan, you better be prepared because I'll give you a lot of information. You got to put it together. And I'm going to let Dan tell you a little bit how he does that. Hallelujah. But this guy, <laughs> what? What did let you say? When he said hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm not going to talk much. You don't mute me. But this guy was fabulous. He is an all-star. He's a future Hall of Famer. Well, this guy is a real deal. Let him explain what he does. Okay, so working working with Ron, I mean, uh, you said I hated you. I never hated you. I always, you know, how, how can anyone hate Ron Bloomberg? But I, you know, it, it was challenging because... You have a ton of great stories and, you know, so, you know, often one would come right on top of the other or you'd go off on a tangent and I'd have to be like, hey, hey, let's hold off on that. Let's finish this story and then we'll get to that. And I'd be frantically scribbling down, you know, so I could remind you 10 minutes later what it was that uh, I wanted you to talk about. But, you know, obviously you're, you know, it's been 
45 to 50 years since a lot of these stories happened. And, you know, through no fault of your own, I mean, that's, it's hard to remember what year something happened or like what other people would have been involved in this, you know, and so that was, that was a big challenge for me is you would give me this great story and then I would have to, you know, figure out when exactly this happened, what season, you know, where in the season. And so, you know, I'd dive into into the newspaper archives to try to figure out, you know, if, if I could, you know, find anything that that related to this. And then a lot of times that would bring up something else like, okay, you talked about this. Well, you know, this other thing happened a week later. What about that? Do you remember this? Uh, this guy was involved. What can you tell me about this guy? And, uh, you know, and nine times out of 10, you would just remember it and, and, you know, or, or have a cool story to share about this player or, or this ballpark or this pitcher you guys faced and how you would deal with them. And, you know, it was so much fun. I mean, it was challenging, but it was great because, you know, it was basically you and I talking about the Yankees in the seventies, you and I talking about Thurman. And, you know, like I said, Thurman was my first favorite catcher. And, you know, like, as you mentioned, like, like, you know, for those of us who were growing up in the 1970s and into baseball for the first time, like all we knew about the players was what we read in Sports Illustrated, what we read in the newspapers. And the whole image I got from Thurman was at the time was, you know, he was a great ball player uh, and clearly, you know, a leader of the Yankees and, and a big force behind their success in 76, 77, 78. But you know, it re the press always portrayed him as a really grumpy, gruff, unfriendly person who did not, you know, want to be bothered with anything other than baseball. And talking to you was so much fun for me because it di you did really open my eyes to a whole other side of him, several other sides of him. And and I feel like that, you know, that if 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 I want people to take one thing away from the captain in me. It's, it's that it's, you know, it's a, a broader dimensional portrait of Thurman and that it's Thurman as a human being, not just as a gruff and nasty ball player. Although to, you know, to your credit, you didn't, you know, I mean, we have some stuff in the book that where Thurman is not so nice and, you know, where he is getting in the face of writers or, you know, other players who are, uh, you know, causing problems. And, you know, and, and I, but I feel, thought that was important to add in there that, you know, this is not just, you know, we're not deifying Thurman. Thurman was a human being. He was a complicated human being. He was a, a person of many moods, uh, the, the, the dark moods that, that the press saw, but also the lighthearted moods that you saw and the, the you know, and the, and the supportive aspects of him, you know, how he supported you through some really dark times in your life. And you know that that really touched me when you when you told me about about that stuff, and I really felt like you know people need to read this. They need to know that like what a loyal friend Thurman was, what a you know what a deep feeling human being Thurman was, and I, I like to think that we captured that. You know, Dan, I started thinking about this probably in the middle of our interview. Uh, all of a sudden, it came to uh, uh, to me, uh, bang the drum slowly. Yeah. And bang the drum slowly. That was a movie that it was funny that Thurman and I was actually in bang the drum slowly. And uh, I was doing that. And it was really fun. And uh, it was a catcher who was dying, I think, of cancer, I believe. Right. And there was a pitcher that they became very, very close friends. And when they became close friends, uh, you know, I mean, they did everything together. And it started thinking about what did Thurman and I do? And we did so many things together. And people, people always ask me, even to this day, even after the book is finished, be honest with me. Tell me what, what was it like? Uh, what was Thurman like to people, to kids? He was a teddy bear. Yeah. Uh, I remember going to the Shriners. I remember doing the uh, 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 Jerry Lewis telethon with Jerry Lewis. I remember doing the Shriners with uh, Marlo Thomas and uh, Danny Thomas. 
And uh, back then, that was 40 something, 50 years ago. And uh, that was a big deal. And when he was there, he still looked gruff because he still wore the same jacket that he wore for like 35 years. It was like a, uh, uh, it was like a polyester jacket. And he used, he wrote it. Oh yeah, did the whole thing. uh, Same uh, uh, sport jacket, the whole road trip. So that was that, okay? So people really wanted to know what type of person he was. Uh, When we went to the restaurants, we we went to the restaurants and uh, we did so many things. uh, When we we went to the stage so many times together, uh, Nat Tronopole, who was very, very much involved in our lives, he gave me a a 450 SL first. And then a week later, Thurman said, I want one. He, then he became real good friends with Nat Tarnopol, who owned Brunswick Records and had the Shaw Lights, Jackie Wilson. Uh, he had uh, Louis Armstrong. He had all those guys. Uh, Lionel Hampton. So, I mean, uh, we're with these guys all the time. He said, I wanted a car. So, of course, a week later, Thurman drives his 450 SL to the player's parking lot. So he had a 450 SL. So then the next time... There was two, three other ball players. They said, you got to introduce me to, uh, uh, and, and <laughs> Elston Howard came up to me and he said, you got to introduce me to Nat. Or, and Phil Rizzuto did the same thing. You got to introduce me to Nat. I said, he's not going to give you another car. So don't even start thinking about that. So they, we all became friends. We all became friends. And the, the book basically portrayed uh, Thurman as a type of person that he really was. And he was a really a genuine person that his first love was Diana, his yeah. high school sweetheart, his high school sweetheart. And unfortunately, he did not have a good home life at first. And, and uh, really, the second father that took over him was a guy named Tote. And people will understand that also, that Tote was uh, 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 Diana's father and uh, uh and the only thing he had was a pool hall and a bar pool hall. And that's what he had. And that's what right. Thurman grew up with. So, I mean, the book was incredible. It was done extremely well. I mean, people, I'm doing, if anybody could see this, this is my Thurman Munson. I've had about 50, 60 people already asked me for this shirt. <laughs> and uh, shirt. Um, I, I, I didn't make it. Uh, the people actually uh, made it in Canton, Ohio. This is two years ago. Uh, I think I'm going to make my own, and it's called be called the Captain and Me. I'm going to sign it if people. And hey, I, I didn't want to be uh, 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 conceited or anything like that. I asked people before I even did it. I said, "Would people be interested in it?" Because I would do it, and I would sign it. If people wanted me to. Maybe somebody wanted to work yard work. And just use it and not a signature on it. Hey, that's their business and whatever. But I had 50, 60 people yesterday and said they want it. They want two of them. They want three. Uh-huh. And they started telling me, I need an XL. I need a small. I need a 2XL. <laughs> I said, you can't do this to me. Yeah, yeah so you, you sure you want to get into the T-shirt business? <laughs> oh, no, no. Wait a second. I, my first order of books, I had 350 books. They left in a week. I, uh, I sold 350 books. That's for Thurman. Thurman. We're getting you great publicity. And I just got another 100 and 65 of them left after two days. And I got another 30 on an order, but I'm gonna have to wait on that. Okay. I may say something, Dan. Yeah. Because I read the book and I love the book. Thank you. And you know, there was the buddy buddy stories were great and all that. And I was a kid during most of those years or even a young adult, I guess I'm really aging myself. And, you know, so it was very, it was great reminiscing and reading those stories and how the Yankees got good again. But what I really loved about your book, and I know I had mentioned it to you before, that underlying theme about how Ron and Thurman were back-to-back number one draft choices. And the whole thing was the two of them were going to like lead the Yankees back to glory. And Thurman was getting better and better every season, you know, when he became a great player. And Ron, when he was on the field, was a great player. But Ron, unfortunately, wasn't able to stay on the field. And that, that, that was sad. Plus, I guess Thurman was defending Ron against some of his more closed-minded teammates who felt he should have 
been on the field more. I mean, to me, that's what really made the book different from then most other baseball books I've read. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, you know, I, I love baseball. I've loved baseball since I was 10 years old, but the, you know, as much as I love the stats and the games and the history, like it's really, you know, the, the human element of the game is really important to me. And it's really important that like, you know, that this book got that across. And in my other books, I try to get that across as well. I mean, the, you know, we idolize these people. We, we, and, and, or we, you know, um, what's the word? Um, you know, we, we, we put them down when they don't perform like we want them to. We, you know, to say, uh, say awful things about them. And, and, you know, and, and it just, that's, both of those things just always kind of struck me as unfair. It's like, these are human beings. These are incredibly talented human beings at, at doing what they're doing, but there's also, there's an emotional side to it. There's a human side to it. There are things that, there are things that work, you know, whether it's, you know, your own body breaking down on you, whether it's, you know, just having the bad luck to, you know, you're going hard after a ball and you run into a wall and all of a sudden you're out for a season. Um, Thank you. You know, it's, I mean, it, these, <laughs> these, these things happen and it, and they could happen to anybody. And, and, you know, and I think Thurman knew, you know, Thurman took a lot of, you know, took a lot of beating behind the plate, but you know, for the, you know, he never went on the DL the entire time. Uh, he, he was, uh, you know, he was playing, but, you know, I think Thurman knew, and I think Diana talks about this in, in the forward that she very graciously wrote for our book, that, you know, that Thurman understood, like, what happened to you, that could have happened to him. It's, you know, it, it doesn't make you a bad person to get injured. It doesn't make you a bad luck charm. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't make you an albatross to, like, you know, you, you know, you and so many other players just like go all out and they wind up getting hurt and that's it. And so, you know, I was, I was really moved by your stories, Ron, about how, you know, you were in such a dark place for, you know, two and a half years trying to, trying to get rehab, trying to get back on the field with the Yankees. And, you know, and by the, you know, by 1977, especially, I mean, you everybody had kind of written you off as this lost cause, except Thurman. Thurman was there every day in the training room, just like talking you up, just, you know, pumping you up, telling you like your career was not over. You could still do this. You were still part of the team. You were still, you know, you still had so much to offer on so many levels. And, you know, I think we all need people like that in our lives. And Thurman was that for you. And I think, you know, even if he had been a, you know, 220 hitter, He'd be an all-star in my book just uh, just for that. You know, I think the major thing is when you grew up, I never had any injuries before. Athletics came very, very easy for me. Football, basketball, baseball, they came very, very easy for me, okay? Uh, the God gave me the ability upstairs to be able to be an athlete, okay? Then all of a sudden, I go into the minor leagues and everything was good. I really didn't get injured. And then I come up to the big leagues. I, I got to put on the Yankee pinstripes, not spring training where you put the Yankee pinstripes on, but you really got to play in Yankee Stadium pinstripes, got to play in the greatest fans in the whole world, got to play from all the Jewish fans and all the Catholic fans and all the Italian fans and, you know, all the, you know, uh, minorities or minorities, and, you know, whatever. And I got to play in front of the greatest fans in the world, got to put the uniform on. OK, then all of a sudden. I don't know if I played, you know, I, I always played hard. I always gave 120 percent. Then I started getting hurt. And when I got hurt, unfortunately, when I got better, I started getting hurt again. Yeah. And then I started getting hurt again. And I'm saying to myself, I never got hurt before in my whole life. I was always big, always weighed about 210. I always were big, strong, uh, was never like an Aaron judge, but I was like a baby judge because I had that type of body because I didn't have any fat on me. It was all natural. I never lifted weights. Only thing we did was construction and we played sports. That's all. Right. 
But the toughest part, I will tell you right now, the toughest part, and it's in the book, that when you get injured and you get injured for one or two, three times, and you miss half the season, then you miss another season, the ball players on your team will look at you and say, this guy is jaking. And that's one word that I hated more than anything in the world because I was a guy that ran into the wall in spring training. I'm the guy that ran down the first base as hard as I can. There's a guy I, I broke up double plays at shortstop. There's a guy I ran into the catcher, to, you know, to knock the ball out. Right. And they 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 call him they they you know I'm a jaker. And the worst part about it, people will read the book that when Billy Martin, it was in 19 what was it 1976. Seven, I think, right? It was well, 1977. Where you what ran into it? the wall? I forgot the years. Yeah, you, you ran into you. It's okay, I ran into the wall. Okay, wait. 77, okay. yeah. Okay, I was having a super spring. I think I hit eight or nine home runs, hitting the ball far, long and far. And my, my, uh, my uh, wrist was quick as a wrist. I'm running fast as anything like that. Uh, three days before I was supposed to break camp, we had myself and Toy Cannon, Jimmy Wynn who was with Houston, and he came over, I think, from the Dodgers, maybe, or I forgot who he came from. But anyway, Billy Martin looked at me three days, four, five days before we were supposed to break camp. He said, Bloomy, you're going to be my everyday uh, a DH, and we're going to use you at first base also. Okay. I said, oh, great. So I go down to spring training. I'm at spring training down in Winter Haven. I forgot who was playing center field. You know, I have recollection and so many different players. I, I just remember that I remember playing left field. Okay. Uh, I forgot who hit the ball. Maybe Doug Griffin or Rico. Yeah, it, was, it was Doug Griffin. Doug Griffin hit the ball, the second baseman for uh, uh, the Red Sox. Hit me a ball. I'm running and running. And running. I haven't played right, left field at all during spring training. Just with hitting. He had me out there. People would tell you. The guys on the team would tell you. They never saw somebody hit the wall as so hard as I did for about 10 years in a row. My, my career was over with. They used to play me. They used to have not the bloops, but they used to have the injuries that people got on baseball fields. They had me down in spring training, uh, run into the wall against the uh, Red Sox in Winter Haven. I ran into the wall in spring training. I died. Yeah. Uh, my leg, I, um, uh, 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 my kneecap broke, my cartilage broke, my ligaments broke, ACL, MCL. I mean, I was dying. I mean, I'm dying. And I'm never going to forget, I'm on the team bus, and Billy Martin looks at me. She, he said, I can't believe you ran into a wall in spring training. I just released Jimmy Wynn. I don't have another DH. And that was the year that they got Carlos May. Well, they got, they, they, got, they got Carlos in 76. And, 76, okay. And then he, and then he, but he also, like, you know, he, he played yeah. on the team in 77 as well. But, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, it, it's so it's funny. My, I, my dad read the book, and he called me after he read that part, and he was just so angry. He was like, what the hell was Billy Martin doing putting Ron in left field? It's like, like you, know, you guys just have a couple of days before you're going up to, up, uh, to begin the season – you know, you're, you're out there playing a completely unfamiliar position at this point. And, you know, what the hell did he think was going to happen? I just wanted to play. Yeah. Hey, I was great to play left field. But, you know, the ball came out to me. It was slicing the left field. I hit that wall. They run out there. Billy Martin ran out there. It was Herman Snyder and Dean Monahan Ray ran out there. I, I remember Herman was a little bit overweight. He's running out there. He's looked at me like that. He said, Bloomy, you better be ready. You better get up because I'm exhausted running this far out here. <laughs> I remember he saying that to me. And I say, I think I killed myself like that. And I broke my glasses and, I, and my nose. Uh, I had uh, uh, stitches, but my knees, I had blood. Uh, I actually had bones coming out of my knee because the bone, uh, uh, the blood was actually shooting out of my knee. So, you know, they wrapped it up good. Then we had to take the trip all the way from Winter Haven back to Fort Lauderdale. Right, and we had a bus buses. ride for hours. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we all, and I remember, I was with Gene Monahan. he's holding my foot. I got ice on my leg like this. 
and I'm dying. It's, you know, it's no more uh, uh, pain medication I can take. And I remember Dr. Canal, they had him at the ballpark at four o'clock in the morning and looked at it. He said, Bloomy, you messed up your knee good. Yeah. Like that. And I knew my career was over with. And I knew, and from that day on, I became, I, I, I was already going through a depression already, but I started feeling good, but I felt awful. I felt yeah. awful. And the guys on the team looked at me, they wouldn't get close to me. I was, I was a, uh, 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 a damaged goods. You know, I mean, I was a jinx. And then I heard like little noises when I go to the clubhouse and I always get there about 11 o'clock. So I won't hear any like little people were saying that guy, Jacob, he's Jacob. We need him on that team for us to win. We got to have him on that team. Right. And I'm saying to myself, what did I do? You know, like this. And I just died. You know, y'all got to get the book and you got to read the book because it's great. The book is unbelievable. I'm not going to tell you any more stories anymore. I'm not going to tell you the ending of the book. <laughs> then you got anything else to say? Well, I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone who is. You there? Bought... You got it. Yeah, I'm still, still here. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's bought the book, uh, whether they've pre-ordered it, ordered it from you, pre-ordered it from Amazon, uh, bookshop.org. I mean, it's, it's, I'm really uh, grateful for, for, you know, how, people are responding to this and you know it's it's uh, I would say if if anybody wants to if anybody who, who dug the book has read it already is, I mean I know it's officially comes out next Tuesday but lots of folks have read it already um, anybody wants to leave a review on Amazon uh, that'll help us a lot uh, but but just in general thank you so much it's it's you know writing a book as Ron said it's a it's a hard thing and it's it's time consuming and I mean, there was about a year there where Rob was shopping the proposal around and trying to, you know, find a publisher that, that was interested. And we got turned down by a lot of places. And, you know, and that's very, that's always discouraging. And, uh, you know, and I, like I knew all the time we had a good book, we, we, a book that people would want to read, but we just had to find the right home for it. And we, uh, uh, Rob found us one at Triumph Books in Chicago, uh, great company. And, you know, as soon as he told us that Triumph was interested in, interested in it, I was really excited because, you know, I, I, I know a lot of those people already and know what a good job they do with their, with their books. And so it's, it's just, you know, to finally see the book coming out after all this time, I mean, two, over two years since you and I first started talking about this, I mean, it's so gratifying. And then to, to see people, you know, buying it and raving about it. It just, you know, it makes me feel really good. I know it makes Ron feel really good. And, you know, it, and it, it, it you know, I, I, one of the great things about writing books, writing books as I have in the past is that it's put me in touch with a lot of really interesting people who have become friends of mine. I feel like, you know, with each book, my, my family expands wider and, you know, and I feel like Ron, you're a member of my family now. And, and uh, I'm really uh, honored to be part of yours. I feel great, Dan. And the greatest thing, I have met so many fans on this. I've had so much fun. I have no idea what social media was. Everybody told me to do it. I got involved with Lenny and Joe and now John Giacovelli. They have helped me just incredible. If it wasn't for them, I, I couldn't. I met so many friends. I, you know, I mean, this is, I'm not bragging. Okay, I am bragging a little bit. I feel like I'm playing again. I feel like a, uh, 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 I'm coming up in the world again, but I'm making these people happy. And that's one thing I'm doing. But one thing I really want to do, I want to put this guy in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. I told Diana, I said, this is what I want to do. He belongs in the Hall of Fame. This guy saved my life. You know, unfortunately, I wasn't around to, you know, help him. But I know that he's looking at me. I'm wearing his shirt. <laughs> uh, people love him. He deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. I'm going to do everything in the world I can to get all my fans. If I, all the books that we sell, if they see that we sold thousands and thousands and thousands of books, and we sold thousands already. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you how many thousands, but we sold, <laughs> we sold thousands of books already. We have, and Dan will tell you. And, you know, when they said this is the hottest book they have had in the last six or seven years, okay? But 
it's it's because of this guy right here. Yeah. They want him in the Hall of Fame. I want him in the Hall of Fame. I met fans. I just want to let you know I love you to death. I I, I did this because it was it, it was it, unfortunately it was a time in our life that we went through that nobody has ever gone through this before. But we have reached people that people found a little bit of life in sports. And I found a life. And, you know, I'm helping my friend. And there's one thing I'm going to do is help Diana and Mike. And I want to be able to see Diana accept the Hall of Fame uh, uh, plaque that Thurman should be in. He is our captain. He still is our captain. He's a Hall of Famer. I want that Hall of Famer in, in back of his name. Thurman Munson, Hall of Fame. It would make me very, very happy. And fans, I love you. If it, it, if, if it wasn't for y'all, we would not be here. We made a lot of people happy. I know that uh, uh, I, I might get on your nerves and you know a little bit, but <laughs> only thing I try to do is make you happy. And In that tone, Ron, I just wanted to mention that on Twitter, you passed, you just recently, actually while we were live, you passed 3,000 followers on Twitter. And that's without a, a confirmed blue check mark. And I'm sure it's only going to grow from there. And I think you guys, you want to give your website or something? Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Big Hair Plas Grass. That's P L A S G R A S. Uh, and uh, my uh, my blog is uh, www.bigharplasticgrass.com. Well, I'm on Twitter, but I have no idea how to do it. Uh, you got Ron Bloomberg it. one. Oh, <laughs> he helps me with my Twitter. I just look at it. I look at the pictures. That's it's like a a comic book. That's what I look at. But my Facebook, my webpage is Ron Bloomberg. It's one O. It's not two O's. People are spelling it with two O's. It's Ron Bloomberg, B-L-O-M-B-E-R-G, Ron Bloomberg 12 at gmail.com. Uh, go to it. You could get a book, sign. And also, if you do purchase a book from Amazon, if you do purchase a book, I'll sign it for you. But you have to sign a, a stamp envelope and send it to me because I got books. I got envelopes here. I have no idea who I'm sending it to. If you get four or five different books from me, I made a mistake. <laughs> but I'm sorry. But I'm sorry. But I yeah, Lenny, pass them out I just, to your friends. No, I, I just want to let you, Lenny, you know, I know I tell you all the time how well you do, but Lenny does an unbelievable job. And he really he does. does. And, he you does. know, and, and thank you. I wouldn't be here right now. I'll probably be out watering my, uh, uh, I just bought some azaleas. And nice. uh, the guy that put them in, because I don't know how to put it in. And, you know, I, you know, and now I'm watering. I'm taking like bucks of water, you know, and watering the stuff. I said, it got to be easier. Let it rain. We haven't had any rain in a little while. But Dan, I'm really happy that we found each other. And too, we are going to have a great time. I think it's going to be a time that we can go out to maybe Barnes and Noble or, you know, uh, you know, Sirius or, you know, a Fox, CNN, and, you know, all, any of these places. Also, the greatest thing, well, you haven't talked about the Wall Street Journal. Oh, yeah, we got a great, do. great re review in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend. That, uh, uh, that doesn't hurt. I want the New York Times. You know, I want the New York Times. I hope we but get one. That made me so happy. But people don't realize, I'm going to tell you what it is. It was 25 last week in baseball books. It's number 13 now. And we're not even out yet. Yeah, not officially, no. We're so. not even out yet. <laughs> Fans, we would not be there if it wasn't for y'all. Yeah. Because we could talk all day long. You do? And Half the time, no, no, no. Half the time, I don't know when, I, you know, like Dan said. Dan, you know why he was being nice to me just a couple of minutes ago? Because I told him I, I had to go like 25 minutes ago. <laughs> no, no, no. But Lenny's having a good time now. When I see him smiling, he's having a good time. But people don't realize how tough it is to write a book and how to keep an interest. And, you know, and, uh, uh, and I, I, I'm, you know, and people, there's so many people who love the cover of the book. Oh, yeah. And, also, Sunday, if you get the daily news, if you get the daily news, it's going to be in the uh, paper. Plus, it's going to be in the daily news on the social media 
uh, com or dailynews.com. The website, uh, they, yeah. do a, they do a, a two-page uh, uh, article about me in the book. Excellent. And, you know, and I'm pushing this. We will, I'm telling you. And you're telling me about 3,000 people in Twitter. I have no idea what that means. I wish it was 3,000 hits. You know, I have no idea. You said, and, uh, but I'm looking at all these people that Twitter and they got six, they got 4,250,000. And I said, I got 3,000. I said, this can't be right. Maybe I could put another zero on the back of it, make me look a little bit better. But anyway, hey, that doesn't make a bit of difference to me. What makes a bit of difference, if, if, if y'all watch this, if you get the book, even if you don't like Thurman, it's a great book. Here, look at the book right here. It's a wonderful book. It's, 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 it's not a baseball book where it's going to be averages and stuff. We don't even know averages. I don't know averages. <laughs> you know, I don't even know anything. Well, we I include just a few averages. It's, uh, you know, a few, but, you know, hardly enough. But I don't even know, you know, a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, Dan, when we're with some different people like uh, Barry Manilow and, you know, and uh, Burt Backrack and Soupy Sales and, uh, Tommy James and Shondells and Jay Black and Frankie Valley. He, you know, uh, Dan knew a lot of last names of all these people. And well, I have no yeah, idea I mean, how he did it. I mean, that, that, that was that was one of the fun things, too, and, and is that, you know, you and I both love music uh, as well as baseball. So and I and I especially love music of the 60s and 70s. So we we kind of speak the same language there as well. And, you know, he's a real, uh, uh, Dan really likes the uh, uh, contemporary hard rock. Can I say that? Yeah. You, you, you like contemporary hard rock. And I'm a soul guy. I'm an yeah. Otis Reddy, uh, 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 Joe Tex. And, uh, uh, I, I love that and stuff too. So this, <laughs> These are my guys. You know, I mean, hey, Mary Wells, my guy. Remember that? Mm -hmm, of course. Uh, oh, we used to play all that. Uh, it was myself, Roy White, Mickey Rivers. Uh, uh, all these guys, we used to play all the uh, soul music, the dramatics and the intruders. And so we really had a wonderful time. But I know that Lenny, uh, the good part about doing it this time of the night, Lenny doesn't usually eat till nine. So we could go for another hour, big guy. You want to go for another hour, Lenny? <laughs> Nothing's <going>. ready. <laughs> no, I know, he's no. ready to go. But hey, but I wanted to let you know again, hey, people, we're making this book very popular. Uh, I think what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the book. Get the book. You'll love it. Even if you don't get it through me, you get it through Amazon. I'll sign it. Don't worry. But you got to get a self-adjusted stamped envelope. I'll sign it for you. Don't worry about any of that stuff. I hope to meet you at the stadium. Uh, if, we, if I'm walking in, if you see me, Please don't hesitate, uh, 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 you know, to talk to me. And what are you going to play? Uh, that means I got to go. Hey, fans, I love you. Dan, Dan, it's great talking with you. Lenny, you I love y'all, big guys. Fans, I love you. Can't wait till I see you. Get the book. You'll love it.